Hi, in this next video, we're going to be discussing the weakness or weaknesses associated with the isolated pawn. All right, we're going to do one talking about the weaknesses of the isolated pawn and then one emphasizing the strength of the isolated pawn. This first game, we're going to look at some games in rapid fashion. I'm not going to be spending much time on the opening and all that stuff like that. We're talking, we're going in the themes right now. If you checked out my last video, Attacks on F7, uh, check it out. Because that's how, that's how it's going to be for a while. We're going to be looking at themes. This is how, this is, this is the, you know, the ABCs right here of chess. You look, you learn this alphabet right here. Your game, your game is going to elevate drastically. Okay, isolated pawns can occur from various types, many different types of openings. Okay, whether it's Queen's Gambit, you know, going into the Terrace variation, whether it's playing the Sicilian, Alapin variation, whether it's the French, and you're playing the Corsnoy uh, variation, whatever. So it doesn't matter. You know, the opening is, is irrelevant. And eventually I'm going to make a video on one, you know, I'm not going to say how to study chess, but... I'm going to I'm going to give one to me what I feel is the best method and that's and that's um starting from the end game. But anyway, we're going to talk about the weakness of the isolated pawn. And the first game we're going to look at is from Scopie. That's right. I did pronounce it correctly. Thank you. That's spelled S K O P J E Scopie 1976 between world champion at the time Anatoly Karpov and <laughs> with the white pieces and uh, Raphael uh, Vaganian with the black pieces. Game started off E4 from Karpov. Karpov used to always play E4 back in his heyday. D4, D5, and he used to play this exclusively against the French defense, the Tarish variation, which uh, Michael Adams, uh, British GM, plays today. Again, we're not going to get into the opening. C5, and this is, um, I like to call this the Korsnoy variation because Korsnoy played it. I mean, if you want to learn this variation from the black side, you follow Victor Korsnoy's games, man. He he uh, he played this to a T and played it a lot in a match he played. I, I can't remember which match. I think it was the first, I'm not sure if it was the first one. Or the second one where he played this a lot. And Karpov really couldn't do anything with it. Of, of course, Karpov went on to win the match. But it wasn't because of this opening. You know, he entered into several isolated pawn positions against Karpov. Karpov could not do anything against it. So this is completely um, justified. So C5. E takes D5. E takes D5. There you have it. Boom. Isolated pawn. Knight G, Knight G F3. Eight. A6 and uh, okay technically it's not isolated pawn yet but now it's about to be isolated okay D takes E5 now there it is isolated pawn and of course there's many resources against the isolated pawns and um, so briefly I'm just gonna state what's the idea what's the ideas behind behind this and why is it considered weak for the most part well the main reason why isolated pawn is considered weak is because it has no friends to help Okay, there's no support from other pawns, uh, in this case on the C6 square or the E6 square. Thus, it's isolated, right? There's no other pawn on the E and C files, thus isolated. So therefore, in order to protect this pawn, it must be um, protected by pieces only. Okay, now we all want to use our pieces to attack for constructive purposes, right? We want to attack the opponent's king. So therefore, if you're pieces are stuck protecting uh, an isolated pawn that weakens your position as a whole because your position your pieces are now placed into defensive defensive duty okay so from white's perspective the idea is to of course attack the isolated pawn all right that's step one step two is black defends the pawn okay then step three is to attack the defenders of the pawn okay and then after the defenders are uh, gradually exchanged off 
Then the isolated, it, it comes down to a king and pawn ending where the only piece left to defend the isolated pawn is the king. And then usually what winds up happening is white um, is able to outflank black somehow where he's able to um, distract uh, white away from the defense of that pawn. Right, because this pawn's isolated, whether it's that uh, white has some kind of uh, outside pawns himself or creates a threat on the other side of the board, usually he creates a second weakness, and then the isolated pawn eventually uh, drops from the board. Okay, and Nemzovich used to say that first you want to um, hinder the advance of the pawn, which is slow it down, second, you want to restrain, excuse me, hinder or restrain, second. You want to blockade and third destroy. Those are the steps if if you are fighting against the isolated pawn. Let's go on and see what happened here. D takes e, uh, D takes e5. So after D takes e5, Bishop takes e5. And of course, the isolated pawn has its, its strengths uh, also. But we're going to emphasize that when we discuss the, the strong points of the isolated pawn. Bishop takes e5. Knight b3. So here's the restraining aspect. Notice how the knight's here. Like in combination with this queen here, or put four, pressure on d4, make it very difficult for this pawn to advance. Okay? This is the restraining aspect. It's not completely blockaded because legally this pawn can be moved. Right? Now, of course, I'm not advocating the move. I see. You know, somebody uh, right in the comment section, oh, the bishop is hanging. Okay, I see that. What I'm saying is legally, the pawn can be moved to d4. So it's not technically blockaded yet. However, it's restrained because, of course, tactically, you won't want to move that pawn at this point. So the first step is restraining. This is for the person that's fighting against the pawn. So you restrain, slow it down. Okay, so knight b3, of course, doing two jobs, hitting the bishop and... Stopping the pawn from advancing. Advance the uh, bishop goes back. Bishop d3. Uh, tactics prevail here. Of course, the pawn still can advance. All right, d4. This pawn, this pawn is going to drop. Okay, the simple tactics here. Knight, f, knight takes with the idea of knight takes, takes. And of course, if queen here. This guy goes by. All right. So bishop d3. It's played knight e7. Okay. And that's to avoid the the pin right after knight f6. Okay. That's one of the ideas. Okay. And so already we see the passiveness associated. The arrow's supposed to go there. The knight wants to be here. We already we already see a passive move from Black, and that he has to he, he has to defend this pawn already. Castle. Knight B C six. Rook E one. <clears throat> Bishop G four. C three. So again. This this bishop initiates a pin right here on this diagonal. So c3 is there again to fortify and restrain. Okay. H6. H3. Bishop drops back. Bishop e3. Okay. This is one of the strategies I was telling you about is that it's it's um in white's favor to reduce the um the pieces on the board because the pieces are what aids actually aid in defense of the isolated pawn so let's get rid of the pieces bishop e3 castle bishop takes queen takes <clears throat> queen to e2 rook f to d8 again half you know, have to make sure that pawn is secured Rook a d1. <clears throat> a5. Okay. Some some um lines has this idea uh involved. 
bishop drops back. Alright, bishop b1. And here's a good move by Viganian actually trading right here. And diminishing the effect. The diminish, dimin, excuse me, diminishing the influence on d4 from white. Now he plays this move. And now he can get to that d2 pawn because this move right here might not have been the best move right here. Pro probably g4 was better. Okay. But instead, he played this move. Bishop takes, queen takes, and a4. Of course, knight d4, completely natural. Queen takes b2. And now we have knight takes c6 from uh, Karpov. And knight takes c6. And so he, he keeps the isolated pawn. Now, of course, he doesn't do that because this piece would be hanging. So Karpov wasn't allowing him to fix the uh, fix his pawn structure there. So knight takes c6. Okay. Threatening mate. Not mate. Well, yeah. Mate in two. So queen f5. G6. Right. So there's all types of pressure on the black position. And this is what I was talking about earlier about uh, getting other weaknesses involved. So he by attacking... Let me just go back to pointing out what's going on. Okay, so here we see the mate, the mate is threatened here, and this pawn is threatened at the same time. This provokes a weakening on the king side with the g6. And now, this is still weak, but now we have an additional weakness here at the same time. Alright, so we see now two weaknesses here. Okay, one... The isolated pawn that we're talking about, and now you have the weakness on the uh, on the queen side, because oftentimes it's not enough to win with just win with just one weakness. So after g6, we see Karpov switches the attack to the dark squares here. Okay. Now rook d7. And black has to already be careful. So, for instance, this move right here loses on the spot. The bishop takes g6. And if f takes g6, queen takes g6, king h8. Queen takes all the king's high pawns. And the isolated pawn. And he would just wipe, just wipe, uh... Viganian out just like that. So rook d7 is played there. The correct move. Karpov plays bishop f5. And here, Viganian looks for simplification here. <clears throat> now here, after G takes F, uh, G takes F5, Queen takes H6, and Knight E7, rushing to the defense of the Queen side. Of course, not that move because you would drop this guy after here. <clears throat> White has a perpetual there, but that's it. Perhaps he can improve. However, Viganian did not play, uh, take that, um, take uh, Karpov up on his challenge. Instead, he played rook e7. The rook takes e7. Knight takes e7. And perhaps hoping to make things real simple after queen takes e7 and g takes f5. 
However, Karpov simply dropped his bishop back to d3, maintaining the threat to capture this knight. Okay. And Alvaganian played the move knight f5. Okay, and now he's not fearing bishop takes f5. And g takes f5 here. And say queen takes h6, for instance. Even though I think white is definitely better there because of the shattered, <coughs> shattered pawn structure. Pawn structure of um, black. But anyway, knight f5. Let me speed up a little bit because I have some game to show you. So bishop takes, was played. G takes. And... Karpov just simply play rook e1. Queen takes the a2. Queen h6. A3. Queen g5 check. King f8. Queen f6. King g8. Queen takes f5. Queen to d2. Rook e7 of course. Rook f8, queen g4 check, king h7, rook e5, and it's getting getting hot here. And of course, <clears throat> Karpov went on to win that game. And, you know, and a few more moves. Um, but the main point is to see... How the attack on the isolated pawn created additional opportunities. And that's a theme that you're going to find constantly. It's not Sometimes if you can win the pawn, you can win it. But you're not always going to be able to win the pawn. But the, the attack and harassment of that pawn will cause black to... It's an old decoy move. You know, it's like you, you're forcing your opponent to focus on one thing and then... Da -da, and you just switch and it all of a sudden attacks somewhere different. And so we see in this game, first Karpov focused on the winning this isolated pawn. We see this like moves like Queen F3. You know, uh combined with the rook on D1. And then all of a sudden we see the king side attack just pop up out of nowhere. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> a different game, knight f3, d5, c4, e6. I'm going to go faster this game because, like I said, I want to get to the main point, which is the isolated pawn. So we have some kind of ready system, ready system. e3, castles, knight c3, c5, again, black. Willingly takes on the isolated pawn here. And d4 from white. And c takes d4. And he takes with the queen. Keeping everything open. Okay. So we see. Isolated pawn on board. Bishop f6. Queen d2. And this is not bad. Some of you are saying. Doesn't black waste, uh, white waste time here. Allowing this queen to be hit up by the bishop. Well, it's not a big deal here. White loves would love to trade in this position. Every step closer to the end game is better. So he would love, for instance, queen uh, d2, and then bishop takes b2, queen takes b2. That's fine for white. That's what he wants. Knight c6, bishop e2, bishop e6. And again, we see the same principles. The restraining, the restraining aspect taking place against the um, the pawn. So the idea that you should take is to control the pawn in front. Excuse me, the square in front of the pawn. Bishop e6. And what do we have? Okay, castle. Bishop takes b2. Queen takes b2. Again, this is happiness. For uh, white, because black has given up his influence over this diagonal and allow um, white to take just to take it over completely. 
Because we can argue now that the queen is actually in a better spot on B2 than it was on D2. Okay. Now we have queen to A5. Rook FD1. Just putting more pressure on this um, D file. Rook FD8. Rook D2. Plan is real simple. A double up. Again, putting more pressure. Notice the pieces being tied up in defense. Pieces being tied up in defense can't attack, can they? Rook D7. Anticipating the doubling. Rook AD1. Rook AD8. H3. So right now, it's it's kind of like um like a like a wash. It's like black is lined up against the pawn, but can't excuse me, white is lined up against the D pawn, but can't really win it at this point. Right? So he just starts trying to improve his position in subtle ways. So he makes a little room for his king there. You know, just in case things get um busy on the back rank. His king has a little escape square. Black does the same thing because white Needs, <coughs> excuse me, white needs to create some type of other weakness in the position. So h6. So now, the battle continues. Remember, I told you, white doesn't mind trading pieces off. So he hit, he challenges the knight. And the rook, excuse me, you know, threatens to win this rook. So, <coughs> maybe rook d6 is better. In other words, so if black is, if white is going to change... He can improve the position. So, for instance, if rook d6, knight takes c6, and b takes c6 will strengthen his pawn somewhat. It will be good for black. So, he should try to make a move like that instead of just uh, acquiescing, which he does here. He plays knight takes e5. Queen takes e5. Okay, this is good for white. Now, queen c5. Bishop f3. Again. Now, everybody, everybody's tied up. Again, how, how does white improve the position? In other words, he needs to create a distraction somewhere else where, whereby he can, whereby he can either win this point or create a weakness somewhere else that he can attack because black is completely tied up at this point in defense but then we can argue that white is kind of tied up in attacking let's continue it's b6 right getting this pawn off of this diagonal here okay but right with this this is like a subtlety right here with this pawn being advanced Okay, have a little bit of weakness on his light squares around here on the queen side. Okay, so queen b d queen b two, staying on the diagonal, keeping control of this square in front. Remember that's critical, because this is this would be a liberating move for Black if he could get it in. Right? Notice this bishop is kind of shady right now. If Black could play that, so this this whole game will re revolve around that. So rook c8 here. Okay, so black is trying to free himself. What's the idea? The idea is if bishop takes, then he just loses. Okay, no liberty. There's nothing here for him in this position. He just drops a piece. So, at the rook c8, white says, wait a minute, black is, is free to move? He just goes right back. It's queen e5, rook c d rook c d a. So black is saying, hey, let's let's have a handshake here. So rook d4. A5 by black. And now, remember I was telling you, white has to try to find some other way. So he commences an attack on the king's side. 
g4 queen c6 g5 h takes queen takes so now we have some other factors involved here now good move here for black maybe a move like queen c2 could come into the opponent's se second rank attacking this pawn and the main idea being to get back over to the uh, queen side so for instance say a move like this it's possible and then you have this weakness of course actually you could just repeat here but let's say um, instead of that white could try to play more dynamically perhaps with the move like rook h4 so after queen takes g5 we see you still have the pressure on the isolated pawn but now there's new things for white to worry about for black to worry about excuse me you got the open g file and it's easy for the king just to step out the way and for the rook just to switch over and attack at any moment. Also, you have to worry about the advance of this pawn. So, f6. Okay, now we know any pawn move creates a weakness, right? And in this case, we see the light squares coming weak, weaker. Queen g6. <clears throat> so, f6 gets some pressure off the d pawn but creates a weakness on the light squares bishop f7 black says hey i have a light square bishop no need to worry queen drops back to g3 f5 now queen g5 just attacking this pawn queen e6 and there it is, king h1. Queen e5, and I think now you get the point. Rook g1, and notice how the attack here, right? That's the formula. This is about the, you know, the, the type of idea you should be bringing against the isolated pawn, which is, general, which is basically attack the pawn, tie up the opponent's pieces in the defense of that pawn, and then... <clears throat> provoke another weakness somewhere else on the board the more weaknesses you can provoke the better in this case you had this pawn on f5 that's weak this this uh, file is good for white the g file the concentration against that and then you even have these pawns right here this pawn on b6 this complex the weak squares around the uh, on the queen side so black has some targets to uh, deal with the rook g1 black play rook f8 voila there it is so not only attacking this right and exploiting the fact that uh, the queen cannot be captured because of the rook on g1 looking at that pawn there <clears throat> so, rook b8. And all, of the, all of these attacks keep all of the black pieces in defensive positions. So now what? And this is this is the game, ladies and gentlemen. You just keep. He's on the defensive, and you just keep probing, 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 because sooner or later. There's going to be so many weaknesses that black won't be able to defend them all. This is going to lead to some kind of um, large uh, loss in material somewhere down the road. So now he's just threatening just mate. So now king f8. Queen h8. Check. Bishop g8. And we see that white is just like holding on by a threat. Right? Just barely... You know, just barely holding on at this point. So now you had this move, rook f4, which is very strong. Again, op opposing the uh, the king. 
This pawn is pinned and attacked. Only thing protecting the f5 pawn is the queen. Okay? So any kind of deflection of the queen in this pawn is going to drop. So now, you see rook b7. Rook b b7 just trying to um, double up on the protection of the g7 pawn. White play rook g5. Another strong, another strong move here is bishop h5. Right, with the idea of playing bishop g6. This is good, just directly attacking the uh, pawn. Again, so now, he's got to play defense. Rook f7. Again, this is a good move. Bishop h5, he didn't play that. Play queen h5. Just building up on this pawn. And again, just notice what happened during the game. Again, just to reiterate, first we started off just attacking this pawn right here. Tying up all the black's pieces. Then, some weaknesses were created. Additional weaknesses were created. And white started attacking those those other weaknesses. Right? Whether it was the G pawn on G7. Whether it was the B6 pawn. And now, at the end here, we see the F5 pawn under intense pressure. Queen A1. Check. King G2. And now G6 is played. And just simply queen takes G6. Bishop H7. Queen D6. Easy finish now. Rook B E7. And then just queen D8 check. And that was the end, the end of the game. Black had resigned. So you see the simplicity... Right, oh, it looks very simple, but it, there's a formula to it. And that formula, again, right from this position, you had this massive kingside attack. You know, and if you were to look at the game, it, it looked like this great, you know, you know, attack. But again, it was just a build up, right, build up of position based on this simple concept an attack against the isolated pawn see some people don't understand they see the isolated pawn on the board and they keep trying to attack it and attack it and nothing's happening and they don't know that they need to provoke weakness elsewhere so they just beat their head against the wall trying to attack right because it got to a place during the game where it was like nowhere to go and once you understand hey i need to create some weaknesses elsewhere you see right there, White could have accepted a draw. Right? But he blocks the pawn. He blockades. See, that's the ultimate right there. And why is the blockade so important? Because even when you're restraining, there's still sometimes opportunities where the opponent can sacrifice the pawn just to free up his pieces. Right? So, okay, you won the pawn, but now your pawn is active. So when when you blockade, there's no legal way to move that D pawn now. And not only does White blockade in this position, but notice how the rook is able to um, travel along the fourth rank, right? So he makes sure the bishop on E6 is dead. He he basically kills the black pieces here. And once he does that, then he commences. He understands, hey, I have to create weaknesses elsewhere. All right, let's go on. Let's look at another game. <clears throat> e4, c5, c3, another way the isolated pawn can um, arise through the Alapin Sicilian. E takes, queen takes, d4, e6, let me flip the board, because this, this is going to be from Black's perspective. Alright, let me go back. So... The game started off e4, c5, c3, d5. This is one of the main lines against the Alapin. Queen takes d5, d4, e6, knight f3, knight f6, bishop d3, bishop e7, double castles. 
queen e2. And finally, black gives in. Play c takes d4. C takes d4. Knight c6. Rook d1. Knight b4. Knight c3. Queen to d8. Bishop c4. B6. Knight e5. Bishop b7. A3. And knight b d5. Again, we see the same same formula. Right? All of these pieces, right, whose point is to control the square in front of the isolated pawn. That's the most important square. The square right in front of the pawn. So that it cannot advance. So that it's discouraged from advancing. Once you control that square, then the next goal is to completely blockade it. Which here, black has achieved. I'm not saying black is winning or anything. But this is what you want. Good. Okay, and the reason why blockade is so important is because it's easier to attack a fixed a fixed target as opposed to one that is moving. White played knight e4, knight takes e4, queen takes e4. Okay, so he removes the defender from the queen's from the king's side rather. And he moves his queen into a more aggressive situation. But this this bishop and e7 is a great defensive piece in these type of positions. Okay, so queen takes e4. Rook c8. Bishop d3. Checkmate. f5. Right, that's a nice move here. Even though the trade-off is that this e6 pawn is a little weak. He blunts, blunts the attack. E6, Queen E1, King scoots over to H8. I don't know how good that move was. Maybe Knight C C7 with the attack on the on this pawn and protecting this right here. Perhaps Bishop F6 also. But anyway, King H8 is played. Bishop comes out, the knight drops back, and we see there's an attack on here, and bishop b4, and of course this can't be taken because move like bishop takes f5, there's a blockade again, knight d5, bishop d2, the game is pretty equal. It's hard for white to really make any progress here. Bishop g5. Bishop takes g5. Queen takes g5. This is good for black. Right? The dark square bishops uh, in this position are exchanged. But the thing is, is white's queen is in a very good position here. Yeah. Knight f3. Queen h6. Just staying on the dark squares. Rook a c1. And remember what I said. To me this is a big mistake. Because strategically. Again. Black is black is the one who wants to trade down. And this just helps. Okay. Knight f4. Attacking this guy. Bishop f1. And this just. Uh, allows black to rip open the king side. He takes queen g5, king h1, h6, just creating a little escape in case needed. Queen b4, attacking this guy. <coughs> Rook d8, just keeping an eye on this isolated pawn. Queen goes back, and now again the opposition always dangerous. Allows tactics e5. D5, Rook takes D5, sacrificed by White, that is ill-advised, Rook C8, 
king just goes up, king h7, queen c2, excuse me, and um, black played b5 there. Nice move here is the queen h5, it's attacking this guy. <clears throat> so at the queen c2, b5, I mean obviously one of the ideas is to keep the bishop from attacking this rook, but um, b5, rook f8, double attack, and he says hey take take the rook. Hey, rook d3, idea is that uh, they'll be made there if this bishop is the leaf. <clears throat> So rook d3, queen c8, and a nice ending here, it's queen g2, they'll be mate after bishop takes, and black and white resign here. So we see from the black side, <clears throat> the same, <clears throat> the same um, scenarios. <clears throat> Okay, the idea of just of this blockading. Okay, now black didn't have to work too hard as far as creating additional weaknesses in the position, because white kind of helped out a little bit. But one of the strategies that black employed, again, white helping out, was the trading down of pieces here. Okay, but the main point of this game, and I didn't mention it earlier because I was, I'm hoping that, you know, you pick it up yourself, but the square in front of the isolated pawn is an excellent jump jumping point. In other words, the piece that's doing the blockading is usually a very strong piece. Like, look at that knight on d5 in this position, how it radiates into white's position. It could jump to wherever it needs to go, whether it's f4, and from f4 it can go to d3, or what have you. They use that, it's like a, d5 is like a train station, where you can, u it's, it's, um, you can use it for different pieces, or the same piece, or whatever. And that's why it's very important <clears throat> for you, as um, when you're fighting against the isolated pawn, to understand it. Notice how the knight jumps in there, right? Right, just to review real quick. Now the knight leaves. Okay, so now the bishop, <clears throat> the bishop's influence is seen through there. Now the knight jumps back. See how it's using that square? Now the knight goes to f4. See, now the bishop, the bishop uh, comes out. But notice how d5, d5 was used as a jump off square. Right, this is all because all inherit in the weakness of the isolated pawn. All right. Let's look at another one. And let's flip the board back. B3, Nimzo Larson attack. D5, let's see how we ended up with the isolated pawn from here. Okay, bishop e7, bishop g2, castle, castle, c5, All right, nice classical play by black, c4, knight c6, c takes, knight takes, knight c3, bishop f6, queen c1, b6, knight takes, e takes, d4, bishop a6, rook e1, knight takes, d4, excuse, knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, <clears throat> c takes d4, and queen a3, attacking this guy, 
bishop b7, rook a d1. So we see this temporary uh, pawn sacrifice. This pawn can't stand too much longer on d4. Bishop e7, queen a4, right? So we see the attack, not so much on the pawn, right? The pawn is there, but more so an attack on the square. Queen e8, okay? Queen takes d4, okay? So it gets the pawn back and has a full uh, blockade. And I like this move here because he doesn't ha he could have traded queens here, but why help black develop this rook? Okay, so this is one of those things where you don't want to play by rote. Okay, like, oh, I need to trade and then just, no, you, remember, tactics is king. Always look at the tactics. So in this case, you see, so now the rook has to move and... You know, black is fully developed. What black is not winning, but this is a good position for black here. Black has the two bishops to compensate for the isolated pawn, and he has the rooks posted aggressively. Okay, black is not worse there. This is better. Queen takes d4. Now this queen here is kind of misplaced. Has to be moved again in order to get the rook out on f8. Rook comes to the C file. And now we have Queen F4. And why is Queen F4 played? Well, this bishop will come here anytime, so it's good to anticipate that. And also the Queen, the um blockading duty is not a duty you want to use you want to have like a high ranking piece. You don't want to blockade with like a queen or rook. They're very valuable. You want to blockade with a piece that um, isn't as valuable. So that's why the knight is the best blockader. One, is because it isn't as valuable as the other pieces. And the other thing is that the nature of its moves. It can cover a lot of uh, squares from where it's at. So the purpose of queen f4 is not only getting out of the way of the bishop, but also to replace the queen with the official efficient blockader. You know, an equivalent would be like in the job world. You know, you wouldn't have, say, like the president, you know, digging ditches or something like that. Okay, that's not his job. You have somebody else, you know, doing that, you know. Somebody lower down, lower, lower down the ladder, you know. You wouldn't have the, the CEO of the corporation, you know, being the elevator operator in the, in the building or something like that. Or a greeter at the door. You know, you have somebody else doing so. The queen is like, you know, very high ranking, very important. Okay. <clears throat> okay, where are we? Move 18. So queen, uh, queen d4, rook c8. Queen f4. There it is, bishop f6, right? Knight d4. So now you got the right guy for the job. And notice how many squares. And I'm not going to, you know, I know the knight can move backwards, so don't. Don't put a uh, message in the comments like, oh, yeah, and show the squares and where the knight can move to, you know, just showing the squares and the enemy territory here. Look at the, radi the radiance of the knight. The knight is very powerful, right? So the knight is where it should be. <clears throat> and again, uh, if you're not sure about the placement of pieces, Check out my video. It's a um, video on how how to select uh, select moves, but I speak about piece location. All right. But anyway, so knight d4 is played, and those of you been paying attention, you should know right now this is blockade. So I don't have to reiterate re reiterate that. Bishop e5, queen e3. Okay, now g6. We have knight b5. A little pressure back there. All right. So he wants to trade here. Now he wants to trade the knight for the bishop. Now black played queen takes b5. I um, see I'm looking at it like this. Black has the two bishops. 
right? He has an isolated point. There's two bishops. I would like to try to hold them if, if I could. I mean, knight knight b5, you know, launches an attack on the d pawn, right? So he may feel obligated to um, get give up the bishops, right? There's there's a lot of things going on here for Black to think about. So let's see, what about rook c5, right? And if he takes here, then you got this move. That's one. That's winning for black. So that's out of the question. So this is double attacked. If he does that, and move like queen b8. That should be okay also. Another move, a4. And then a6. We already showed that knight a7 can't really happen. And then again, knight d4. <clears throat> and I think black is okay there. So I think rook c5 was a better, <coughs> excuse me, a better choice there. Instead, queen takes b5. So now he gives up the bishop here. And also with... Um, with three pieces attacking the isolated pawn and the queen being unprotected. So now rook f e eight. And these are some tactics that uh white excuse me, black was probably anticipating. Like okay, queen moves and basically he can trade the E pawn for the D pawn and his troubles will be relinquished. But Surprise for black at the queen b2, the e pawn is protected, and the d pawn is still under tremendous pressure. Queen c5, and remember now the themes we discussed the pawn, the square in front of the pawn, right? d4, right? That's still under control. So there's pressure on the d pawn, but again, there's no real immediate way to win this pawn so this means you have to search elsewhere you gotta start provoking some other weaknesses so h4 now remember i'm not saying like for instance i'm not saying this is the best move or not but i'm just saying the plan is that you have to f provoke weaknesses elsewhere so of course everything is governed by tactics Another good move here could, you know, e3. For instance, making sure this guy doesn't move. Okay? But remember that you gotta, you're going to have to, in this kind of situation, you're going to have to create a second weakness to attack. So, Rook. Uh, what do we got here? So, uh, get ahead of myself here. Okay, so after, where are we? 24 queen b2 made a mistake anyway it's 24 queen b2 not queen c5 but rook to c5 h4 and now notice too the awkwardness of this setup that <laughs> protecting in this pawn right that's a common theme is the the pieces get awkward at times and you can exploit that tactically so now rook e c8, doubling up. Of course, you don't want him to penetrate the file, so rook d2. Rook c3. <clears throat> rook e d1. Queen c5. And right here, this, this can be taken. But he plays those b4 in there. Queen e7. Again, he could take. He plays e3. And now h5. He could still take. He doesn't. He still doesn't take <laughs> a3. So he's being extra cautious. King h7. And finally he takes. So the pawn just drops. Okay. And that's a, that's something that happens also sometimes. Sometimes the pressure 
this cause you know the pawn will just drop like a you know like fruit from a tree just drop into the hand so usually like you pile up the pressure the opponent defends then you got to create some other weakness or provoke weakness elsewhere and then you wind up winning as a result of the new weakness or sometimes the material just drop so bishop takes d5 bishop takes d5 rook takes d5 and now we see queen e4 black's only um chance is to try to become active so he because that's another um another way out for black sometimes is to sacrifice the pawn for activity so that's why you, ha you, ha you have to consider that also so in this case at the rook takes d5 if rook c2 right away then black excuse me white has rook d7 and then can go into a favorable ending so here he plays queen e4 rook d8 and slick move of course with the coordination of the queen and rook queen f3 of course wanting to mate somehow king h2 now you have rook 8 to c4 and white has to be careful with you know certain sacrificial themes rook 1 d7 sorry this rook g5 and black goes for broke And rook f8, king g6, check, king goes back, and rook takes g5, rook c8, rook d, d5, the threat there, king h6, and rook d, f5 with this attack on the queen, and black, and black was forced to resign there. So we saw in that game that the weakness of the pawn proved to be too great and black merely stopped defending it with hopes to create some kind of uh, king side attack, which works sometimes. So that's something that black, excuse me, that white, or if you're black playing against the isolated pawn that you have to consider, right? Because it's easy to mess up in, def in defense, you know, when once the uh, opponent starts attacking like that, even though... He's a pawn down. Okay. All right. Let's look at one more. One more game here. And see. I have literally like hundreds of these games. But um, I try to pick like the short ones. And get the point across so the video is not, you know, five hours uh, long. Okay, let's look at um, another one. Let's finish it off with another game from Karpov. This game is from Leningrad, 1973. So this is a young Anatoly Karpov. Um, right before he hits his peak. You know, he probably hit his peak in about 70, 1974, 75 and this is before he became world champion versus Gennady Kuzmin. Okay. And um, in this game, Karpov started off with E4, E6, D4. And I told you that he used to play uh, the Tarish against the French. Uh, Tarash, Knight D2, C5, E takes, E takes, Knight G, F3. Knight c6. And the first game I showed you was between Karpov and Vaganian at Skopje. Okay, so you see him playing the uh, same setup, right? This is just three years earlier. Okay, so after 5, Knight c6. Bishop b5 is played. Bishop d6, and you get that tempo because now the bishop is, instead of the bishop being here, Bishop is hit, has moved already, so you kind of get the time back. So he 
has to make an extra move. Okay. Again, isolated pawn appears on board. Castles. Knight G E7. And the same formula. And that's the key is remembering not so much the move, so to speak, but just the jet the formula. What you need to do. And when when you know what you need to do, the moves will kind of come to you. Right? This restrain the idea of restraining, blockade, destroy. And then if you and if you can't destroy, you know, the, the pawn then cert, then provoke weakness elsewhere. Okay. And you'll attack the new weakness, and then if they defend the new weakness, you come back to the old weakness. Okay? And you go back and forth. And you might have to um create a provoke a third weakness, right? Always keeping tactics in the front of your mind. And eventually your the speed the speed of your attack will be too much, you know, for the opponent to um you know to keep defending and your attack will um come through victorious. So Bishop G five is played. Castle and Karpov plays Bishop H four. And these moves look a little little questionable to me. Looks like he's wasting some time here. Ganyan plays Queen H Queen Queen H Queen C seven. I like this move right here. Because remember Black's uh White's idea of um blockading this pawn and controlling the square in front, well, Black's idea has to be totally opposite, which is to for, for himself to be able to liberate himself by pushing this pawn and controlling the square in front of the pawn himself. And Bishop G4 um, kind of supports that end right there. But Queen C7 was played uh, by uh, Kuzman. Bishop G3. Of course, Karpov wants to trade some pieces off. And so now here it is. Bishop G4. A move later. Rook E1. Rook A. D8. And remember, trying to get control of this, this square. C3. You see, so this guy gets tied up. And there's the backup. Queen B6. And now Bishop D3. Okay, now Knight G6. Of course, you got to watch these ideas here. Like Bishop takes, check, followed by Knight G5, and then picking up the Bishop. The idea behind that, Bishop D3. <laughs> so Knight G6 happens. Queen C2. Now we have to ask ourselves, is that possible? Of course not. Right? So everything is still under control here. But meanwhile, he's just connecting his rooks, completing the development. And notice, he's not concerned about any type of double pawns. Right, he's happy that um, if Black is willing to part with his last bishop, because that gives him a single dominating light square bishop. Okay, bishop takes, so he trades down another piece is traded off, and the king is still safe behind here. There's no attack coming from White. Excuse me, from Black. Rook d6. Karpov plays this move f4, which takes the e4 square away from these pieces. Rook f d8. Okay, now this move a3 happens. And h5. So now we see some um, provocative play by black. And usually... And this is a psycho psychological aspect that I want to bring up. Usually in these positions, right? Black knows he has an isolated pawn. He knows he has to play actively. And sometimes when the pressure starts getting cranked up, where it looks like 
white's plan is just going too smoothly, sometimes black will weaken himself. White won't really have to provoke anything because black starts feeling uh, anxious, you know, feeling like, hey, I got to do something. This guy's just trading down and uh, he's blocking the isolated pawn and I got to do something and he'll just make a, you know, like have an outburst, so to speak, and weaken his own position. And A3 is one of those kind of moves. You know, A3 is a good, solid move. Nothing to write home about. But black is feeling, hey, I got to do something. So he attacks this uh, slightly compromised structure over here. Let's see how Karpov reacts. So he just played King G2. H4. Right? And Karpov, man. Phew. Right? So King G2, H4. 22. Move 22. Karpov plays this move. Rook E2. Just deadly, just quiet, quiet, deadly move. Right? Like, he's not even worried about it. He could have played, somebody like Kasparov might have played a move like this. Right? He just, real quiet move, just doubles up on the open file. Or, or brings the rook to E2, I'm sorry. Now, Vaganian plays Knight F8. Here. Okay. Now, interesting enough, he could have played d4 here, right? And, of course, he doesn't want to trade. That just totally liberates um, black. So, the move has to be c4 with this threat here. Queen c7. And perhaps a move like that. Rook h1. And so, even though this pawn has been pushed, it's still blockaded. Blockaded on D4 now instead of D5. Okay. So, an in interesting uh, position there. But instead of pushing, he played Knight F8. Call Paul played Knight D2. Again, he's not worried about this push because he plans on blockading it on the next square. Okay, so call power for all intents and purposes gives up on this idea right now. So again Okay. Now here it would be attack tactically flawed because after knight D two Okay, so now tactically he doesn't have that anymore. But for the move before that, d4 was possible. Knight d2, rook h6. Okay, now he comes here, f3. And Karpov kind of uh, forces black to open up the h file, which is interesting. And straighten out his pawns at the same time. Knight d7. Rook a, e1. King f8 and g4 again now if here if here d4 now then white would just simply play a move like bishop c4 And if D takes C3, Queen takes C3. I don't know. Let's make a no move like Knight F6 or something. G5, right? And then just start attacking on the uh, King side. Here. And Rook takes there. And we have Rook E8. This will lead to a mate. And I just threw that variation in just to show how the switching attacks, right? Switching the object to attack is very common 
in these type of positions. So even though your your original goal is to attack this pawn, don't be afraid to switch the object of your attack. Especially to, you know, attack the king, which often happens. Like, don't get so stuck on, I gotta attack this isolated pawn, that you, you your eyes aren't open to other possibilities. So here after g4, queen c7 was played, g5, knocks the rook back, king g3, knight c5, bishop f5, g6, moment of truth here, call power plays b4, knight comes in, knight e4, takes, takes, and now the pawn just drops ingloriously. King g7. b5 knocking the piece out of the center. Queen e7. This is what Karpov wants, of course. Trade. Queen takes. Knight takes. Rook takes. d3. Rook c7. And um, <clears throat> Karpov, of course, went on uh, to win this game here. So, let's go back. I'm not going all the way back, but again. So, I think that's enough games to show you basically the weak side of the isolated pawn. Because I can show you more and more and more games, but then, you know, it should start looking redundant after a while. And hopefully, again, if you have to watch this video a couple of times until you understand how to play against the isolated pawn. Okay? Like, try to, pra try to practice that. Like, playing against isolated pawns and just performing those steps. Again, restraint. Okay? Attacking the isolated pawn. Then you attack the pieces that defend it. Okay. And then your goal again is to judiciously uh, trade off pieces. And get to uh, winning endgame. And then if it if it's a standstill where you have the same amount of attackers against the same amount of defenders. Then from there you want to search and probe and provoke other weaknesses and positions. As what happened in this game. Where the attack was just transferred to the king side. So I hope that was beneficial to you. And uh, good luck in your future chess. And I'll see you on the next one.